Sir Stefan here. Today's view comes from the shoulders of Lucifer Means Lightbringer. More about LML, as he is known, in a moment. But first, his cornerstone theory. Hands off the thumbs down button. A comet, which was passing the sun, broke apart. One piece struck one of Planetos' two moons, bringing it down in a firestorm of meteorites which caused the long night. Now, LML's coconut theory is woven of many intricate and knotty threads, but for today we will discuss what I consider to be the two more foundational concepts. First, the history's tales and lore presented in A Song of Ice and Fire contain what LML calls a bard's truth about Planetos' actual past. Second, and more interestingly, the celestial and meteorological events of the past are pantomimed by the present-day characters, objects, and events. Before digging in, a quick word about LML. You may have seen LML as a guest on the History of Westeros' YouTube channel. I'll put a couple of links in the description to videos in which he starred. However, his website, LucifermeansLightbringer.com, is the place to visit. I'll link it below as well. There are hours of high quality, a song and ice and fire podcast, transcripts of podcast, photos, art, music, and the like. One will still be skeptical following this short introductory video, so I dare one to listen to LML's podcast and defy his mountain of evidence. Part 1, The Lightbringer Legend, and Origin of Dragon's Lore. From a Davos chapter in Clash of Kings comes the legend of Azor Ahai's Lightbringer, the Red Sword of Heroes. He labored on the third blade, and as it glowed white hot, he summoned his wife, and Azor Ahai thrust the smoking sword through her living heart. It is said that her cry of anguish and ecstasy left a crack across the face of the moon. Such is the tale of Lightbringer. It won't become clear until later, but Azor Ahai is a fire warrior, representing the sun. His wife, Nissa Nissa, quote, woman wife of sun, is the moon. And the fire and blood sword is the aforementioned comet. We find the end of this story in the World of Ice and Fire book. Quote, in Quarth, the tales state that there was once a second moon in the sky. One day this moon was scalded by the sun and cracked like an egg, and one million dragons poured forth. Here the dragons represent the meteors and meteorites. And we will hear the exact same history from Daenerys' Lyceni handmaiden. A trader from Quarth told me the moon was an egg. Once there were two moons in the sky, but one wandered too close to the sun and cracked from the heat. A thousand thousand dragons poured forth and drank the fire of the sun. One day the other moon will kiss the sun too, and it will crack and the dragons will turn. Note for later that this seems to describe an eclipse, and more importantly, that the dragons or meteorites drank the fire of the sun. This diminishing of the sun is, of course, the long night, and caused by the nuclear winter-like conditions following the meteorites' impacts on planetos. Part 2. Present-day characters, events, and objects pantomime the sun, comet, moon, long night legend. In this part, I'll present three examples. The red priest Benero's hand gestures, the two swords Tywin had forged out of ice, and the fight between the Red Viper and the Mountain. LML thinks that if you're trying to explain this theory in a game of charades, that you can't do much better than the High Priest of the Red Temple of Rolor in Volantis. From, from a dance with dragons, Tyrion. Benero jabbed a finger at the moon, made a fist, spread his hands wide. When his voice rose in a crescendo, flames leapt from his fingers with a sudden whoosh and made the crowd gasp. The priest could trace fiery letters in the air as well, Valerian glyphs. Tyrion recognized perhaps two in ten. One was doom, and the other, darkness. To quote LML's summary of this, the destruction of the moon by, the f by fire led to doom and darkness. LML also introduces the idea that comets often break apart due to gravitational forces near other relatively large bodies and proposes that our comet passed the sun and split into two parts before one part hit Planetos' second moon. One place this idea of the comet splitting is pantomimed by current events is with the sword Ice. I'll quote LML here. 
Ned's ice is directly compared to the Red Comet by Arya. Ice was split in two by Tywin, and of course lions are the most common symbol of the sun in world mythology. And now paraphrasing. The two new swords made from ice are wood as well, referring to Nissa Nissa's cry as the sun is blotted out, and Oathkeeper, possibly pretending the return of the second part of the comet, or Azor Ahai reborn. Though I'm not sure about the latter, now is also the time to add a piece to our Sun, Comet, Moon, Meteorites, Lawn Night lore. Running through the history of Planetos are the stories of a black and bloody tide, or the waves of night and blood. The calamity of the second moon's destruction not only blotted out the sun in a nuclear winter like Maelstrom, but the meteorites also set off Great Tsunami, which washed over land structures like the Iron Islands, leading to stories like the Sea Dragon Naga. But weren't we talking about the new Lannister swords? In Storm of Swords, Tyrion inspects Widow's Whale. Tyrion wondered where the metal for this one had come from. A few master armorers could rework old Valerian steel, but the secrets of its making had been lost when the doom came to old Valeria. The colors are strange, he commented as he turned the blade in the sunlight. Most Valerian steel was as gray so dark it looked almost black, as was true here as well but blended into the folds was a red as deep as the gray. The two colors lapped over one another, without ever touching, each ripple distinct, like waves of night and blood upon some steely shore. How did you get this patterning? Patterning? I've never seen anything like it. I worked half a hundred spells and brightened the red time and time again, but always the color would darken as if the blade was drinking the sun from it. This has been number 85 of the Holy Hundred, or at least its first half. Tune in next time for our third example of the pantomiming of past celestial and meteorological events, when the Red Viper meets the mountain. We'll have an introduction, a reading from the fight, a summary of both of these halves, and a cool reveal of a symbol of the Long Night. (laughs) 